decision to let the eviction moratorium expire is a plan to allow the eviction of thousands of working class renters in Seattle starting on March 1st. This is inhumane and unacceptable. Well, that's Council Member Shama Sawan talking about Mayor Bruce Harrell's decision to end Seattle's eviction moratorium at the end of February. And she's also talking about some legislation she's introducing this week to extend it. What's going on with that story? What's going on with a deadline that just passed that does not look good for the West Seattle Bridge? And can Seattle create a system where we have fewer than 30 people who are homeless downtown within a year's time? Well, we are working to answer these questions and a whole lot more here on Seattle News, Views and Brews, your Coffee Break political podcast. I'm Brian Callanan. I'm a host on Seattle Channel. The views expressed here are my own. And joining me, really walking the talk or maybe flying the talk, I guess you'd say, uh, is David Croman, who is joining us here at Seattle Times, transportation reporter here. When I think transportation reporter, I don't always think I'm going to see people coming at me from an airport terminal, but that's where you are. David, <laughs> what's going on? How you doing, man? I'm doing well. I'm in the San Francisco International Airport on my way home. So I love it. I love uh, it. And that blue sky behind you looks very, very tempting. I, yep. I welcome back to the gray in 20 degree temperatures when you come <laughs> home, my man. So we'll see how that goes. David, thanks as always for being with me. Thanks also to City Grind Espresso, our background noise sponsor for the audio podcast They're on the first floor of City Hall. Please support them and other small businesses, too. Thanks also to our patrons, hoping to get a few more of you to support the show. And if you can, at the $10 level, we will send you your very own Seattle News Views and Brews coffee mug. David, I don't expect to really have a travel mug. No. That's okay. We'll, we'll figure that out at some point here. Uh, our mug club members always featured uh, on our mug shot of the week. This week it is Gary, who had just to uh, fire up his cup of, cup of coffee in the microwave there. And thank you, Gary. They are micro, microwave and dishwasher safe. Many thanks for sending in that photo and patrons. Please do send, a more, send some more of these our way. If you want to support the show, check out Seattle News Views and Brews on Patreon. And finally, thanks to Converge Media, the video version of the podcast is on Converge Wednesday nights at 7. Let's get rolling with right here, right now. Well, David, a follow-up on a story we talked about last week. Mayor Harrell's announcement that he would end Seattle's evic eviction moratorium at the end of the month of February. So this week, the council is considering a resolution sponsored by Councilmember Sawant that would extend that moratorium for the length of the civil emergency. And I reached out to the mayor's office on this one because we talk a lot about non-binding resolutions a lot from the council. That is not the case with this situation. From what I understand from the mayor's office, this resolution could actually modify the language of the mayor's order. It would be binding, and it's something that the mayor could not veto. I guess just looking at this, David, is this the kind of fight that the council wants to get into with Mayor Harrell? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's exactly the kind of fight they want to get into, but it's the sort of fight you would maybe expect them to get into. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the council is still, you know, d despite um, Sarah Nelson's victory uh, election to the citywide council, you know, the council is still to the left of the mayor's office on this and on a whole host of issues. And so I think this kind of falls squarely into a fight that I'm, I probably would have expected um, to come. But, you know, I mean, the, the council, too, is is trying to kind of figure out how to wind down from some of these emergency measures or measures that were put in place to address the COVID emergency. I mean, we've talked about that a few times, the, the yeah. hazard pay hazard pay for grocery, grocery workers. workers. And, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, you know, it's a recurring theme with these kind of these measures that were put up as emergency responses to, you know, what, when do you start winding them down? And, yeah. um, you know, Mayor Harrell thinks clearly thinks the time is now um yeah but you know there there are there are still data out there that show that there's a lot of folks who are behind on rent yeah um, yeah, and, yeah and so and covid cases are still high too i mean not yeah, as high we've seen those numbers drop but they're at least as high if not higher than what we saw during the delta variant for sure right yeah um and so um you know i i don't i don't really know how this plays out but um, yeah. it's it's a it's a fight that i especially from council member swan would almost be surprised mm -hmm. if if she had not brought something like this. Forward. Right, right, right. That That's a really good point. And I, I know that there was a hearing about this at the committee level on Friday, the committee that Council Member Swant heads up here. And we did hear at that point from a few small landlords who support Mayor Harrell's decision to end the moratorium, approaching this with less of a blanket approach as they see it, and more on focused financial help for people who need it. And talking about renters and small landlords here too, David, I know that the mayor has set aside $25 million in rental assistance funds for this. And just in time, really, because the county funding for this type of aid is drying up. But we touched on this last week. Is this enough to really help the people that need it with the estimated, I think it's 96,000 people we're hearing in the Seattle area who might be behind on rent? 
Yeah, I, I don't I don't know if it's enough. I mean, I think um, yeah. we we have seen that because um, I mean a lot of hundreds of millions of dollars have come through the county and they right. have used it all. Um, yeah, right. And so um, you know we know that this need is there, and we know that there are a lot of people who are. Um, you know, at this point, it could be upwards of more than a year behind behind on rent. So, right. uh, you know, we heard fairly regularly about people's rent bills being over ten thousand dollars. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, twenty when you're talking about individuals who owe more than ten thousand dollars, then suddenly twenty five million dollars can go <laughs> can go pretty quickly. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know, remains to be seen if it's enough or if this will sort of work in tandem with whatever aid in other places is still available. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, it, the, we have been hearing about a you know sort of wave of evictions, a warning mm-hmm. of a wave of evictions for for months yeah. now, and yeah. you know maybe in a couple of weeks here we we might actually start putting that to the test to see if that's right, gonna happen. right. We'll see. We'll see. I know the Washington Housing Association uh, mentioned this at the end of October of last year when the statewide eviction moratorium was lifted. There was not this tsunami of evictions as right. we saw there at the state level. So we will have to see. Seattle is always a different animal than the state, that's right. for sure. But something to be keeping an eye on here over the next couple of weeks. And we'll see what the council does, too, this week about this. I wanted to talk about another deadline coming up uh, this week. And this is a really interesting one here, David. It actually just passed, as a matter of fact. February 20th, it came and went. That's the date Mayor Harrell and others said needed to be met for ending the ongoing concrete strike. And if that date was not met, that could lead to delays for the reopening of the West Seattle Bridge. Just broadly on this to start, David, I want to make sure concrete workers are absolutely treated right. But as a West Seattleite myself, this is <laughs> the last news I wanted to hear. Your thoughts on this? Yeah, I'm, the, the hard deadline is kind of interesting, but I, I think that's sort of the calculation of you know, there's there's obviously always a million things going on in large construction projects, and mm-hmm. um, you know when something like this happens, they kind of shift their you know where maybe concrete isn't available. They kind of shift their focus to uh, you know okay, we can do more kind of uh, tensioning of the of you know cable tensioning or right. It's do, not like some other thing to stop. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, right. So you've, they've got this long list of things they can kind of audible to, but this concrete driver strike has now been going on for, I think, three months, more than three months. Um, yeah, November so is when it started, right. Mm-hmm. At, at a certain point, that list of projects that you can do starts to run out. Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, Mayor Harrell is obviously not a construction manager on the yeah. on the bridge. So, you know, I yeah. don't know how, ex- how exact that kind of February 20th deadline yeah. was, or if that was yeah. kind of, you know, at the time when he mentioned that, um, this, this was a press conference sort of explicitly geared towards kind of leveraging the two sides right. into mm-hmm. a settlement. So, you mm-hmm. know, it's hard to know kind of what of this is um, factual and what of this is sort of uh, rhetoric to kind of force the two sides together. But right, at a certain right. point, you know, what we do know is that um, the, the bridge doesn't needs, a, you know, a relatively modest amount of concrete to finish. I was going to say, yeah, something mm-hmm. like 20 or 25 truckloads, I think, is what mm-hmm. Council Member Herbold said. Um, so we right. do know that at some point it's going to need concrete. Uh, yeah. Whether that day was, you know, literally yesterday or whatever the twentieth was, um, right, 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 I don't, right. I don't know. But you know, at a certain yeah. point, um, logic would say that yes, this is going to start causing real delays. And it's interesting, you bring up that amount of truckloads of concrete about this. I've actually talked with Heather Marks from SDOT, who's the project, mm-hmm. who's overseeing this project on the West Seattle Bridge, and she told me it's not necessarily like a one-for-one one situation. Like, let's right. say they resolve the concrete strike a week later than they thought they did. Oh, that only means a week delay. This sets a lot of different things in motion. And I yeah. think it's important to point out there are a lot of other bigger projects out there, bigger than 25 truckloads of concrete that are, I think, of sound transit, for yeah. sure. Some of the projects that are going on there. I just wonder how that pecking order goes when indeed this res- uh, this concrete strike is resolved. I mean, I have right. to think the West Seattle Bridge might not be top on that list. Right, yeah, because it's not like, you know, if usually these concrete companies would sort of, you know, have have a triage of, of mm-hmm. uh, you know, where they're sending their drivers. But if right. suddenly, you know, we're at a point now where everybody needs concrete. And yep. if, mm-hmm. if this strike ended tomorrow, they're all going to, they're going to have a lot of people kind of pulling them in a lot of different directions. And, you know, sure. including in addition to Sound Transit, you know, the, the Madison Rapid Ride Line yeah. um, mm-hmm. construction there, you know, a lot of people need the, the, the affordable housing center. projects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah convention, convention center. center. Good. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, even if it ended tomorrow, all of those, all of those entities are going to be demanding concrete all at the same time. So, um, wow. yeah. yeah, it is. Um, it, I think this will even, even if it ends quickly, it'll be something uh, where the ramifications probably ripple for a while. 
I was going to say, because you got to rehire workers, get them back. It's not, it reminds me so much of what we've been talking about as we try to emerge from the COVID pandemic here, this idea of kind of flipping the switch on the economy off and turning it back on. Right. It's not right. like it comes, you know, not, it's not like it comes back immediately. I see a lot of uh, parallels to what's happening here with this concrete strike. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, because um, Peter Rogoff, CEO of Sound Transit, I think he said that they had laid off almost 300 yeah. workers at Sound mm -hmm. Transit. And, and not, yeah. you know, these are workers who basically don't have anything to do because there's no concrete. And so right. it's not like, it's not, I, I wouldn't imagine, I haven't talked to any of them, but I wouldn't imagine they're just sitting there kind of twiddling their thumbs waiting to sure. be rehired. They're probably looking for work elsewhere. And, Absolutely. Um, so yeah. it's not like, it's not like they're even, they can just like snap their fingers and bring all those people back. Right, right. Yeah, not going to be that easy. This is something that I think is going to have an impact for weeks, months to come here. So we're going to be watching this very closely over the next several days here. All right. Well, up next, can the King County Regional Homelessness Authority come through on a proposal to have fewer than 30 homeless people living downtown? We're talking about it coming up on Now Hear This. Well, we had a big announcement last week from a group called Partnership for Zero, made up of big local businesses, philanthropists, who have put in $10 million towards a plan to focus on downtown Seattle and reduce the amount of homeless encampments there. The CEO of the County Regional Homelessness Authority, Mark Dones, says they can use this money and within 12 months, we would have 30 or fewer people who are homeless downtown. Is that possible? What, well, here's a little bit of what Mark Dones said at the press conference last week. The system currently produces 6,000 housing exits per year, right? So what we are talking about is not beyond the scope or scale of what we are currently able to do. What we are talking about is putting dedicated effort behind ensuring that the most vulnerable people in our community get the support that they need. Well, David, Mark Doan seemed very bullish on this, talked a lot about approaching people who are homelessness, where they are, not getting them help that is prescribed for them, but getting them help they're, they're asking for. I just think about this though, 30 people or fewer who are homeless on the streets of Seattle 12 months from now. Is that possible? Y your thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know if it's possible or not. Um, I think, um, I, I imagine the public is gonna approach, is, is gonna hear any pledges like that with a healthy dose of, dose of skepticism. I was gonna because... say, it feels so much like Mayor Nichols giving a, a B grade to the uh, snowplow work of, of 10 years ago, but yeah. Keep right, going. well, yeah. and you know, anyone who heard the 10 year plan to end homelessness. Right, uh, sure. 10 mm -hmm. years after that, of course, it, it was as worse as, as it's ever been. Um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but you know, I think in some ways this is the, was the promise of the King County Regional Homelessness Authority, which is mm -hmm. that they are going to be a kind of central hub for all things, uh, homelessness. And that included private philanthropy in addition to uh, county money, city money, money from the United Way. Part of this was always going to be money from businesses. And, and so, you know, we're seeing that with this $10 million. Um, it, you know, to put it in perspective, the city of Seattle before this was spending over $100 million a year on homelessness. Um, right. So in relative terms, $10 million, um, while certainly could be impactful, is not um, mm -hmm. a a uh, you know, exclamation point to put homelessness mm -hmm. to an end. Exactly. Right, um, right. You know, the big question, but, but, you know, I, I do think that this is a shift um, toward uh, acknowledging that um, for, for people to get the help they need, it, it does mm -hmm. need to be the help that they want. Right. Um, right. Rather and, and this is all about the the peer navigators that I think that yeah, are going exactly. to be the bulk of, of what's paid for with this program. Keep going. Right. Yeah. Um, the, these these peer navigators, formerly homeless folks, who can kind of um, approach homeless people with uh, empathy and kind of uh, ask them what they need. For me, mm -hmm. the real question is space on the other end. Um, yes. Right. And and that's kind of what this always boils down to is you can have the kind of the best interactions in the world with folks, but you do need somewhere for them to land mm -hmm. that is. Uh, serves their needs, yeah. um, you know, and, and is a place that they uh, want to and are, are able and, you know, have the support to, to stay there and flourish. Yeah. Um, right. And, right. And that is always kind of where this conversation, it's a little bit of a, a roadblock is, uh, yep. is, are there enough of those kinds of places? I think most folks at this point agree the answer is probably no. I mean, there is a lot of work towards building more of those places, mm -hmm. but uh, mm -hmm. is it enough? Uh, you know, we, we, I don't know about that. Yeah, and is it going to come online? The concrete strike, yeah, exactly. I, I hate to say it, is going to impact uh, work like that too. And and that's the the number we're talking about here, David. At least what we've heard from the RHA is that 
in between 800 and 1,000 people are within this confined area of downtown Seattle who are on the street, who are homeless, who really need the help. These are those people with, with high acuity needs. You've often heard that phrase mm -hmm. used there. They really have a lot of needs there. They need some special attention or whatever else. But again, when it comes down to it, these are the numbers we're talking about, 800 to 1,000 people needing a space to live. And I, I just don't know if they're going to be able to ramp up the amount of shelter beds or however you want to look at it, shelter spaces there, because we're not using the, the congregate model anymore. Mm -hmm. Are they going to be able to have enough have enough to take on this load of people. I, I think that's going to be the huge test of all of this. And, and you know, what, what we have seen and what, you know, service providers will readily acknowledge is a lot of these folks, you can't, it, it doesn't work to just, even if the, if it's a nice room, it's got every, you know, all the amenities. Sure. It's not enough to just put a lot of these folks in a room and, and call it good. Yeah. I mean, a lot yeah, of them services have to go with struggle, too, with, sure. struggle mm -hmm. with pretty severe addiction or, or mental mm -hmm. health struggles. And mm -hmm. so you, there, there needs to be kind of services to support them along the way and make sure that they um, are able to kind of get established. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, every industry is having pretty severe staffing shortages, but the, the service industry in particular is, it just does not pay well. Um, yeah. And Seattle is expensive and we, and we know that. And so I think uh, an additional challenge to the space question is the staffing question. Can you find yeah. enough people to stay for a long enough time that they can actually yeah. help these folks get established is, is another kind of big question mark. It's huge. And I know that's something that's being talked about at the state level this year, trying to uh, get some more dollars headed out to these people who are doing this very important social service work. And maybe I can use that as a leapfrog in the next topic I wanted to talk about here. There's another state law out there that's very interesting here. I talked about this with council member Andrew Lewis last week, David. This is something he's really pushing the state legislature to work on here to make it easier to build tiny home villages. So folks, this is Senate Bill 5428, sponsored by Senator Joe Wen out of the 34th District, right down the street from me in White Center here. The, the bill has made its way through the Senate. Now it's in the House for discussion this week. So this would exempt tiny house villages from state environmental review. Then, and when they are in areas that are, uh, we're talking about uh, places that might have a homeless state of emergency, this is where this would apply. That would include Seattle, King County, Tacoma, Thurston County too, around Olympia. So the homes would have to be used for people experiencing homelessness. That's the first part. Couldn't have more than 200 beds and could not exist for more than five years in the same spot. So no permanent structures because this isn't supposed to be permanent housing. That's all the back uh, backstory on this one. But David, I thought this was a very interesting bill because it brings into focus this whole idea of, okay, we need housing. Where are we going to put this thing? And this whole idea of these CEPA reviews really can be weaponized when it comes to people who don't want that housing near them. It, it's it's an interesting topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This, and this is almost sort of a different level of homelessness than what we were talking about before, which is, yeah. in, I think, tiny homes are kind of geared for people who maybe don't need as much um, support from caseworkers and things like yep. that. Mm -hmm. So these are folks who, um, you know, maybe more likely to have had one kind of thing kind of go terribly wrong and they're struggling yeah. with homelessness, but maybe they don't have quite the depths of mental illness or addiction struggles. And then they're, so fair. therefore, yeah. home, you know, tiny homes kind of exist as a way to you know, help those people get off the streets uh, in, in a quick manner. And then, you right. know, when they're in the tiny homes, sort of in theory, figure out the next steps for them. So right. I think, um, you know, it is it, the, the, the SEPA, the SEPA question is a, is a big one that mm -hmm. is um, often discussed in context of housing and building things. I mean, I think yeah. a lot of people who would like to see more uh, housing built or, more, you know, kind of the process sped up, have a lot of issues with SEPA and how it's sure. used. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, I, this this tiny home thing is is interesting because you know Mark Jones um, has also said yeah you know, they they don't want they don't it's not that Mark Jones is against tiny homes but right Jones Jones was saying that they don't want it to become kind of a substitute for the the real mm -hmm. <laughs> the, what what's really needed which is what we were talking about before kind of long term permanent stuff yeah permanent yeah. housing um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and for people who have those additional needs too. It is interesting though. I just look at, I look at tiny homes as kind of that, uh, that one of the parts of the uh, supply chain, if you want to call it that, right. for housing that is in our area and could serve that need potentially. It's interesting to see this bill gain a little bit more traction in the state legislature this year, a 41 to eight vote, uh, yes vote from the Senate, meaning a decent amount of bipartisan support there. Do you think this is the year this might pass through. I, I, I mentioned this because it really looks like our state legislature is taking a much deeper focus on homelessness this year. 
Yeah, it possibly could. And I, again, I think it's appealing to for, I think it is appealing on a broad level because uh, it it can sort of act as a crutch to get folks off the streets really quickly who maybe don't need as much support as I talked about. But also, you know, I think I think we're hearing more and more um, frustration with just the visibility of homelessness from people. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of cuts across party lines. Uh, and tiny homes is frankly kind of a fast way to make homelessness mm -hmm. not quite as visible because yeah. people who would otherwise be um, staying in tents, now maybe they're kind of staying in these little villages and it's not quite as um, quite as visible. And so that is something that I think, uh, yeah, like across political spectrums, we are increasingly hearing people want to express. I mean, it's what Mayor Bruce Harrell was sort of elected on. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's not all that surprising to me that it is getting bipartisan support. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting to see this. This is a bill that would require these locations to have a plan for waste and water. Also set up a community advisory committee to deal with any complaints from neighbors here. So uh, they're really working on crossing a few more T's and dotting some I's with this this year. So, folks, keep an eye out for 5428. That Senate bill sponsored by Senator Joe Wen. We'll see where that goes and we'll keep tabs on that one, too. All right. We want to move on to another story here that may make you scratch your head just a little bit. King County repealing its bike helmet law. What's going on with this? Well, it's time for Transportation Talk. Well, David, I have discussed this issue on the podcast over the past few months, and it's finally here. King County repealing its mandatory bicycle helmet law. What is going on here? Why, why is the county doing this? It seems very counterintuitive when it comes to public safety. Yeah, so the, I mean, the first piece of context is to note is that um, King County was the largest jurisdiction in the country to have a helmet, a mandatory all ages helmet law. Most places across the country do not have this. New York City, L.A., you know, even Portland has some helmet laws, but not all ages. You know, it's not a very common law um, in the first place. Uh, the, the second piece of context is it was um, almost never being enforced. Uh, and, and that has been especially true in recent years. You know, it was being enforced sort of moderately in 2017, 2018, a little bit 2019. But uh, since then, it's been, you know, we're talking almost single digits per year of number of citations that police are handing out. It mm. has just not been a priority at all. Um, mm. And then, you know, when, when you look at who is getting those, minor, those relatively few uh, helmet citations, you know, when I was back at Crosscut, we did some work on this uh, to, to show that most of the people who are getting this these the citations are struggling with homelessness on some level. Um, and, and when you hmm. kind of dig a little bit deeper into a lot of those citations, there is some evidence that they were being used mostly pretextual, that the police had other reasons they wanted to stop individuals and were therefore yeah. using the, the helmet law to, to do that. And so, yeah. and then, you know, a, a different group had done some analysis to show that most, uh, you know, a, a disproportionate number of people who are getting helmet citations were, were black. Um, people of color. And yeah. so, mm -hmm. I think the combination of um, it's it's relatively minimal enforcement and and when it was enforced that it was being disproportionately applied mm -hmm. made the King County Board of Health reconsider whether or not this was serving its purpose. Um, I see. Yeah. The, the the counter argument to that is you know there there is no dispute that helmets do protect people while yes. they're riding their bicycles and and that mm -hmm. was never an issue in the Board of Health. Nobody. True. Yeah. You know, they passed a resolution along with this repeal talking saying, about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Saying you know we support helmet use and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but th th there is um, some concern that you know by repealing this you sort of create a culture in which uh, helmet use is not emphasized as being as important as it is. And sure. we heard from quite a few um, emergency room doctors and, and fairly mm -hmm. higher up high up medical professionals saying. You know, by, by repealing this, we are sort of uh, sim symbolically sanctioning riding without a bicycle helmet. Uh, right, right. And I, I know there's been a lot of talk at the King County Council level about education. We're really going to bump up education, and that's going to try to help things out here. But I think some of the critics have said, well, education sounds great, but when the headline says we've repealed the helmet law, how are you supposed to educate people? I, that, that That's a difficult piece of this. Yeah, right. No, and, you know, I, I, I think... I, what the Board of Health has also said is, you know, when, when this helmet law was put into place in 1993, the, the mm. helmet as a as a piece of technology had only existed for a couple decades. I mean, it was right, still relatively right. new. And it was just, okay. the, just, you know, the idea of even wearing a helmet when you were riding your bike in 1993 mm -hmm. was was a novel idea. But yeah. now it is fully ingrained, fa fairly, fairly ingrained into our society that you were supposed to wear a helmet. 
um, when riding a bicycle, then that is safer. And so they're saying that, um, you know, we support wearing, wearing helmets. Mm -hmm. And if this were a, if this were a neutral law that it was mm. doing nothing at all, we might keep it on the books. But the fact that it is being disproportionately applied in this way, mm. and not to mention Seattle Police Department has already come out and said, we're basically not going to enforce this anymore. And that right, right. Before beforehand. The yeah. Mm -hmm. They made the calculation that the, the harms of it outweighed the, the benefits. Um, it's, yeah. It's, so, you know, so, yeah, I, I, I look at this, though, David, and looking ahead, I think there's going to be some scrutiny on the data sure. that comes next. I know you study a lot of different things when it comes to traffic incidents, traffic fatalities. The city of Seattle has not had a good run with that over the past couple of years, especially during the pandemic here. And I, I, I wonder what happens next and the data that needs to be studied to see what impact this law is going to have. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, is going to have. Yeah, right. right. And, and I do think the, the county council will study that. It, it will be hard to study because... Mm. You know, if you there, at, as at the same time as this conversation has been unfolding, of course, mm -hmm. um, scooter share and bike share has become yep. much more common. And if you exactly <laughs> there was a study, there was a study. I think it was 2018 that found that Seattle riders on their own private individual bikes, it was 91% yep. of them wore a helmet, but right. on bike share, on the the rental bikes, only 20% were wearing a helmet. Mm. So it's yeah. even when this even when this law existed. Uh, you had hundreds and hundreds of people every day who were riding yeah. through the city not wearing a bike helmet. And then, of course, because, you know, maybe they were commuting to work or something, they were also not being pulled over by police. Sure. Um, right. Right. Wow. And so, you know, um, it, it, it'll be I, I think I could see this sort of becoming a Rorschach debate mm. in some ways where um, if, you know, any kind of injury to somebody not wearing a helmet might be tied to the repeal mm -hmm. at the same time, um, uh, sort of advocates for for better bike infrastructure say, well, really, I mean, the way to keep bikers safe is to build more bike lanes. Yeah. Um, right, right. Oh, man. So, <laughs> uh, you, you know, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. It was, um, yeah. you know, this this debate over this has been happening for the better part of a year, but it wasn't right. until mm -hmm. the last few months that really we saw the, the outspoken opposition to its repeal. Right. Um, but, you know, the, the county plowed ahead with it, and I think, yeah. um, I think they're going to feel some pressure from the outside. Uh, yep. And... and I'm sure that they will, will continue to track uh, yeah. to, to see what? its effect. Oh, wow. Well, we'll keep on tracking that one. And thanks for breaking that story down, David, yeah. in the Seattle Times. We need to wrap up the show. And I've been noticing your, your many travels on Twitter. Always interesting to follow what you're doing, my man. So you <laughs> took a trip to Seattle City Hall last week, which I have been visiting about once a week over the past two years, much less often than I would normally have for my work with Seattle Channel. What was it like for you being in that rather empty space for one and what do you think it's going to be like when seattle city hall is supposed to be open mid-march here as mayor harrell is talking about yeah it was nice to be back in there i mean it's a nice building yeah. i i like the space um i was just there because i was downtown and i need some needed yeah. somewhere to sit and work for a while and it's a public yeah, it's pretty quiet space. in there right now yeah exactly um <laughs> yeah you know as a reporter of course I, I i get a lot out of just being around other people you know mm -hmm. I, I like being in city hall because that's when you kind of you run into somebody that you didn't know you needed, wanted to run into, or someone yeah. pulls you aside and right, gives you a little right. tip or something. And you lose a lot by not being in that building. So true, it was nice true. to be there, even if there was nobody else there. Yeah, I know. Well, one, one fine day, David, we will meet right. and uh, maybe we'll figure out how to have a cup of coffee at City Grind Espresso or something, man. I, I can't wait good. for that day. So uh, I got to say, David Croman, one more time, round of applause to you, sir, for coming <laughs> through from an airport terminal, making it happen for the podcast. Dave, thanks a lot for joining me. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. All right. And thanks to everybody who's listening out there, especially to our patrons. It's Seattle News, Views, and Brews, where you can always find out what's brewing in local politics. The podcast is on all major platforms, wherever you might listen. Please do subscribe and also support our show on Patreon. Always appreciated. Thanks for watching on Converge Media 2. We will see you soon. Seattle News, Views, and Brews is an independent production of Callanan Media Services. Copyright 2022.